It is finally time to talk about the new 13th generation of Intel Core processors, and here I have the i9-13900K as well as the i5-13600K, but today I'm just going to focus on the i9 and I'm going to cover the i5 in one of my next videos. Now, Intel claims that this i9 should be the fastest new consumer CPU for both gaming and for productivity, which is quite a big thing to say after what AMD has just shown us with their Ryzen 7000 CPUs. So, we did a lot of benchmarking yet again in the last two weeks. Uh, we tested 23 different games on three different resolutions, and there is a lot of things to talk about today. So without further ado, let's just begin. This video is brought to you by Seasonic and their Prime TX power supplies. These fully modular, high-quality power supplies are extremely efficient, they are very quiet due to their new hybrid fan control that stops the fans completely under 40% load, they offer a variety of connections for any kind of systems you have in mind, and you even get the new 12-volt high-power connection you need for the brand new RTX 4090 graphics cards from NVIDIA. They range from 650 watts all the way up to 1600 watts for the biggest enthusiasts out there, and as a nice bonus, you get a cozy 12-year-long warranty. Check them out using the links in the description below. These new Raptor Lake processors are built on Intel's previous Alder Lake generation. Uh, they're also hybrid processors, which means that they have a combination of faster P cores and more efficient E cores, but this 13th generation has more E cores added to them for better multi-threaded performance. For example, this new i9-13900K is a 24-core CPU with 8 P-cores and 16 E-cores, while the last generation i9, the 12900K, also had 8 P-cores, but it only had 8 E-cores. The performance of the P-cores should be improved as well, and that is partially due to the fact that these new chips are running at even higher clock speeds, going up to 5.8 GHz, and the TDP has gone up slightly as well, from 241 watts to 253, but as you will see later on, the actual power use can vary a lot. Intel is also launching their new Z790 chipset to accompany these CPUs, but these new processors are also compatible with the previous uh, Z690 boards, as well as all the current Socket 1700 coolers. Uh, they support DDR5 as well as DDR4 memory, and in my opinion, it is so good to have that choice, unlike with the new AMD Ryzen CPUs. So, if you want, you can save up a bit and combine these CPUs with a DDR4 motherboard and cheaper DDR4 memory, which should be a very interesting combination for the i5 CPUs, for example. But if you go for this very high-end i9, you will probably end up getting a fancier DDR5 motherboard with some faster DDR5 memory. That being said, it is also important to mention that the 14th generation of CPUs and beyond will probably require a new socket because Intel has a history of changing sockets every two years and then compare that to AMD, they will continue to use AM5 for at least a few generations more. So you shouldn't expect to just upgrade your CPU when the next generation comes out if you buy this new motherboard right now. But let's talk performance. I am mostly going to compare this 13900K to the previous generation 12900K, as well as the AMD Ryzen 9 7900X, which should cost about the same as this i9. Now for my testing, I used the ROG Z790 motherboard combined with Corsair's DDR5 6000 memory, and for the GPU, I went with the new RTX 4090. The motherboard is set to its default settings uh, with the XMP profile enabled and resizable bar is enabled as well. As always, if you want to know all the specs of all the benches used in this review, please do check the description down below. Starting with the multi-threaded performance in Cinebench R23, the 12900K was just under the Ryzen 9 7900X, but the 13900K destroys both with a score of almost 41,000 points. That is 38% more than the AMD chip and 52% more than its predecessor. Now, I don't have the 7950X myself, but other reviews I've seen show that that one scored between 39,000 and 40,000 in this test. 
In Cinebench 20, there is a similar gap between the three processors, with the new i9 being 35% and 49% faster than the 7900X and the 12900K, respectively. In the short Blender BMW benchmark, the 13900K uh, manages to complete it in just under one minute, which makes it 37% faster than the 7900X and 56% faster than the 12900K. And it looks even more impressive if we add some older CPUs to that graph. It is twice as fast as the Ryzen 9 5900X, it is two and a half times as fast as the 11900K, almost four times as fast as the 9900K, and about five times as fast as the Ryzen 5 3600X. If we look at the longer gooseberry render, you can see the 7900X closing the gap a little bit, uh, going from 37% to about 21%, but the difference is still quite big. And it is again 50% faster than the 12900K. But if we look at the power consumption, it is also using about 50% more power during that test. The ASUS board is maintaining the higher boost speeds for longer, as normally it should just drop to about 250 watts, but the bigger problem of a chip that wants to run 300 plus watts by default is the cooling. Now this H150i Elite is one of Corsair's best all-in-one coolers and it was barely managing those 300 watts. So to get the most out of this i9, you need a beefy 280 or even a 360 millimeter all-in-one and I would say that is a minimum requirement. Now this only applies to the situations where your CPU is fully stressed because while gaming, your CPU uses a lot less power and the average CPU temperature in the gaming benchmark was only about 50 degrees Celsius. Single-threaded performance is up significantly as well. In Cinebench R23, the 13900K beats the 7900X by 12% and the 12900K by 16%. In Cinebench R20, the i9 is 11% and 14% faster than the Ryzen 9 and the last gen i9, respectively. But how does all this translate to gaming? Now, God of War starts out pretty close. Uh, the 13900K and the 7900X both score 308 FPS average on 1080p, with the 12900K being a few frames behind. On 1440p, the new i9 takes a small 2-3% lead in average FPS, but a 10% lead in 1% lows, going from 203 to 221. And on 4K, it is again pretty close, with a small advantage in 1% lows for the 13900K. Cyberpunk 2077 is a game that notoriously seems to favor Intel and Nvidia, and that just really shows with the 13900K being 30% ahead in both 1080p and 1440p. But what is interesting here is that both i9 score about the same on 1080p, but the 13900K holds up much better on 1440p. On 4K though, it's again all pretty close. Spider-Man Remastered is pretty interesting. The AMD system performed really poorly in this game, and even on 4K resolution, it ended up being much slower than both i9 CPUs, which kind of makes me think that there is some sort of a bug in the optimization that just needs fixing here. But between the two Intel processors, we can see the impact of a CPU bottleneck nicely. So the 12900K caps out at 193 to 194 FPS average, on 1080p and 1440p, while the 13900K manages to get around 240 instead. Dying Light 2 also seems to favor Intel, but the effect is a bit smaller. The 13900K just about beats the other two CPUs in average FPS, although it does give a nice improvement in 1% lows. World War Z is another title that is nicely CPU bound at lower resolutions, uh, where the 13900K really shines, uh, beating both the 7900X and the 12900K with ease. But at 4K we see a much smaller win as we're more GPU bound on this resolution. 
We see a similar story in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, where the 7900X and the 12900K go head to head and show a CPU limit at 1080p and 1440p. And again, the 13900K really raises that limit by about 17% on 1080p and 13% on 1440p. Doom Eternal is awesome for GPU reviews because it scales perfectly with the GPU power, even when you hit crazy frame rates. The 3900K does show a small improvement at 1080p and a couple of percent over the 7900X on 4K, but I would say they are all pretty close here. Far Cry 6 is another game that really benefits from more CPU power instead, and also the one that shows that these CPU limits can cause some weird behavior. The game was actually running slightly better at 1440p than on 1080p on both 13900K and 7900X, but again, the 13900K did better in this game. In Watch Dogs Legion, the 13900K beats the 7900X by a bit over 10% on all three resolutions, and it is just ahead of the 12900K on 1080p. And it is about the same in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. The new i9 is 10 to 15% faster than the AMD, and there is a small difference from the 12900K. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, on the other hand, doesn't show huge differences between the three, but we do see another win for the 3900K, with it being 7% faster on 4K resolution, which is definitely not insignificant. And in The Division 2, the 3900K shows reasonable improvements on 1080p and a small but measurable improvement on higher resolutions. Anno 1800 is interesting because it bounces between CPU and GPU limits depending on uh, what is going on on the screen. So we see good scaling across different resolutions, but we also see the impact of a faster CPU. The 7900X uh, does really well compared to the 12900K, but fortunately for Intel, the new i9 overtakes it yet again. Borderlands 3 is a game that performs more like you would have expected from a new CPU. On 1080p, the 3900K shows a big improvement, and that shrinks as the resolution goes up. Troy Total War shows exactly the same thing, so we have a reasonable improvement at 1080p and smaller improvements at higher resolutions. Wolfenstein Youngblood also scales great with more CPU power, with the 3900K taking a big win at lower resolutions. Dirt 5 shows a CPU bottleneck for the 12900K at around 257 FPS average, which the 13900K raises to 285 FPS. Now, this game also brings a much needed win for the 7900X, or at least at 1080p. The 13900K just beats it at higher resolutions. Formula 1 2022 shows some of the smallest differences in any of the games so far, at any resolution. Uh, the AMD has marginally higher average frame rates, and the 13900K has marginally higher 1% lows, but they're all pretty much the same. Microsoft Flight Simulator is a game that leans on the CPU more than any other, which uh, leads to each CPU showing pretty similar performance uh, no matter which resolution you choose. But yet again, the 3900K comfortably beats the other two by 10 to 28%, depending on the setup. And finally, CSGO. The 3900K shows a reasonable improvement over the 12900K, and compared to the 7900X, it is actually very close, with some small wins for both of those CPUs, depending on the resolution. You will probably never notice them while playing, so purely for CSGO, any of these CPUs will be just fine. Now, if we compare it to the last gen i9, 12900K, the new i9 is about 10% faster on 1080p, about 8% faster on Quad HD resolution, and about 2% faster on 4K resolution, which is not unusual for a generational upgrade. But if we look at all of the games lined up, I think that the difference is pretty significant. So, on 1080p, out of 20 games, 7 of them show a 5% difference or less, but there are also 9 games that show more than 10% of a difference, with Spider-Man going all the way up to 26%. 
On 1440p, where you would expect the gap to close a bit, 9 games again show a difference of 10% or more in favor of the 3900K, with several titles going above 20%. In other games, we are clearly GPU bound, with 8 games now showing less than 2% of a difference, although always in favor of the 13900K. On 4K resolution, 16 games show a less than 2% difference, so we're definitely GPU bound in most games, uh, with the Microsoft Flight Simulator being the biggest exception with a 10% improvement. Compared to the 7900X, the 3900K looks a little bit stronger, uh, with being about 15% faster on 1080p, 12% faster on 1440p, and a bit over 5% faster on 4K resolution, which is actually more than I expected. On 1080p, the AMD is only faster in 1 out of 20 games by a small 3% margin, while Intel leads by 5% or more in 14 games, 10% or more in 12 games, and 20% or more in 6 games. On 1440p, the AMD scores 2, 1% wins, but Intel wins by 5% or more in 10 titles, and with 20% or more in 5 of them. On 4K resolution, as expected, the difference between any high-end CPU is very small. 13 games show a gap of 5% or less, but 4 games still show a gap of 10% or more, with Spider-Man being a strong lead yet again. And I have to say that some of these differences did surprise me a bit, because based on their single-core performance, I would have expected these CPUs to be a lot closer in games. So when I reviewed the 7900X versus the 12900K using the RTX 3090, they were extremely close. But now, with a much more powerful RTX 4090, the balance has actually shifted towards Intel, with some games like Spider-Man, like Flight Simulator or Cyberpunk, suddenly showing these big differences that we didn't see before. That being said, it is really important to remember that the RTX 4090 as well as the AM5 platform are very new, and it is completely possible that AMD will push some updates to let their CPU get the most out of this fast new graphics card. And speaking of improvements, uh, Intel has some work to do as well, because I said I tested 23 games, but I've only shown you 20 so far, because I've been having a lot of issues in some of the games. The problem is mostly with the Windows 11 22H2 update, but I'm still calling out Intel here because they insisted we test with this version because it supposedly includes important updates to the thread director. But then with this Windows update, several games had severe performance issues, and this all applies to most other CPUs, but it just seems to hit the 13900K much harder than others. Control and Rainbow Six Siege were completely broken and barely playable with constant micro stutters, and Outriders didn't seem that bad at first, especially on high resolutions, but on 1080p, the 1% lows dropped considerably and the stutters got unbearable. So something is clearly broken with 22H2, or at least in some specific titles, because most other games seemed completely fine, but it really does affect these new Intel CPUs, so it's also on Intel to make sure that this gets fixed, and I truly hope that they will get it done sooner rather than later. All this aside, I'm still very impressed with this new i9. It takes a crown in single-threaded performance, it is much faster than the 12900K in every regard, and it comfortably beats the similarly priced 7900X in multi-threaded applications, and it is the fastest gaming CPU you can currently buy. AMD has made fantastic steps with their Zen 4 processors, and they definitely deserve lots of praise, but with this new 13th generation, Intel instantly managed to put some pressure back on, which is great news for us, which is great news for the end user, because healthy competition is what makes companies work harder to make sure that their next product will be even better and even faster, and that is exactly what both AMD and Intel proved with their latest processors, and I have to admit, I'm just anxious to see what AMD will do next to close this gap again. Now, that is it for today. I really hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, 
please do click the subscribe button so you never miss my uploads. Bye guys and see you in the next one.